The neuroscience of chewing. Can this provide insight into healthier eating? Tune in to find out only here on the People Scientist Podcast. Listening to the People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on neuroscience, physiology, and nutrition. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, my People Scientist Army, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast for episode 81, where every week I arm us with some scientific evidence so we can all be a little bit smarter and healthier every week. How are you doing today? How is your day going? I hope that I can bring a little bit of sunshine to your day in today's episode. For today's episode, I was brainstorming and I often am interested in the neuroscience of our eating behavior. Like what role does our brain play in food cravings, in overeating, in undereating, like in eating disorders like anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Then when we can learn the role of our brain in these eating behaviors, that gives us insight into what we can do to gain control of our eating behavior. For example, in past episodes, like in episode 1 and in episode 59, I talked about how certain brain regions are activated, inducing sugar or junk food withdrawal, and how we can prevent those brain regions from being activated in order for us to stay on track with healthy eating. I've talked about how sour and bitter taste receptors and how they signal satiety and to reduce appetite and reduce food cravings. Because through evolution, sour and bitter taste signaled spoiled food or potentially poisonous compounds. So when we taste something really sour or really bitter without any sweetness or saltiness added to it, our brain is telling us to stop eating. And that insight might be able to allow us to stay on track with healthier eating. These episodes personally have been the most fascinating for me and will form the foundation of my own lab and research one day soon. So I kept thinking, what else might influence our eating behavior? And that's when I thought about the research that has been done on chewing, or in other words, mastication. For example, it is very satisfying or satiating for us to eat crunchy foods like pickles, chips, fresh vegetables, fresh crisp fruit, etc. Why are those things satisfying to us? What is the neuroscience behind it? And can we use that science to our advantage to help us eat healthier? Let's find out. So as we always do, let's start off with some core takeaways. There are many aspects to eating and drinking that signal to our brain to either continue eating or to stop eating. For example, the taste of food, the amount of fat, protein, carbohydrates, the amount of volume in our stomach. And today I'm going to talk about the act of chewing itself, how it's also a signal to our brain to control our eating. I bet that you've heard of the concept of mindful eating. Now, mindful eating is when we pay attention to what we are eating instead of watching TV or being on our phones while eating. Mindful eating is to pay attention to our food, to eat slowly, and to enjoy it. Mindful eating is somewhat based on the science of what chewing our food signals to our brain. Many clinical studies have investigated that simply chewing food itself, and particularly chewing food that has a crunch or texture like a salad, activates certain brain regions involved in satiety and causes the release of hormones that reduce our desire to eat. 
So can we use this information to help us eat healthier? Yes, perhaps. If we are prone to overeating, consuming a lot of things that do not require chewing, like smoothies and soups, may not activate this particular pathway in our brain that tells us to stop eating. So if we are prone to overeating, we could choose foods with a crunchy texture that require time to chew, like fresh veg vegetables, fresh fruit, pickles, etc., or to increase the time that we spend chewing. This may help activate additional pathways to signal we are full and satisfied, also known as satiety pathways. However, it is also important to keep in mind that over-chewing or obsession with eating very slowly or even biting fingernails and other similar habits are common practices in disordered eating as well. There's always a spectrum of lifestyle practices and on that spectrum, health lies somewhere in the middle. Now, let's get into the scientific details. There was a clinical trial published in the journal Physiology and Behavior by Smeets and colleagues, and their goal was to see if simply chewing a salad could alter one's appetite. So the scientists asked the participants to either drink water, or to chew a salad but not eat the salad, so to chew the salad without swallowing the salad, or to eat the salad and or a soup. Then the participants were asked to score their desire to eat and their feelings of satiety. Now satiety meaning their level of satisfaction, fullness, and lack of craving. The scientists noted that chewing the salad only resulted in a decrease in their desire to eat but their ratings for hunger did not change. Now this is an intriguing trial because it gives us insight that the act of chewing itself seemed to reduce the desire to eat. So why might this be the case? Well, there was a great review written in the journal Physiology and Behavior in 2015 by Mikhail Kurgo. The scientists combined together 16 experiments that investigated the impact of chewing food on appetite and eating behavior. They noted that chewing significantly reduced self-reported hunger. Increasing the number of chews per bite increased gut hormone release, and chewing the food promoted satiety by influencing appetite, intake, and hormone release overall. For example, Lee and colleagues in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2011 asked participants to chew a meal either 15 times per bite or 40 times per bite. The scientists then measured levels of gut satiety hormones in their blood. Now, These hormones they measured regulate our blood glucose levels and our appetite and feelings of hunger. When the participants chewed each bite 40 times, they tended to eat less and had higher levels of cholecystokinin, glucagon-like peptide 1, and lower levels of ghrelin. Now these hormones have been and continue to be studied extensively in the context of eating behavior. Glucagon-like peptide 1 or GLP-1, for example, is thought to induce feelings of satiety, satisfaction, by acting on GLP-1 neurons in our hindbrain. Cholecystokinin is also thought to induce satiety and fullness. Ghrelin, on the other hand, acts in the opposite way, where it is typically released when we are fasting or hungry and promotes us to eat. So the fact that chewing more per bite increased the satiety hormones and reduced the hunger hormones was seen as a potentially beneficial thing in the context of preventing us from overeating and as a potential mechanism as to why chewing more per bite might increase feelings of satisfaction and fullness. So this made me ask the question, well then, how about chewing gum? Some people think that chewing gum might influence their desire to eat or appetite. Clinical trials either support this notion or have shown no impact. For example, Heatherington and colleagues in the journal Appetite in 2011 asked participants to chew gum prior to eating a snack. The scientists wanted to see if chewing gum could influence their appetite and amount of calories they ate. 
the scientists observed that yes, hunger and desire to eat were reduced, and feelings of fullness increased when participants chewed gum prior to eating the snack. Another study by Swoboda in the journal Eating Behavior in 2013 noted similar findings, reduced reported feelings of hunger when people chewed mint gum prior to a meal. However, when the same scientists asked participants to do this as part of their regular routine for two weeks, there seemed to be no significant impact on their total calorie intake if the participants chewed gum prior to eating their meals. So chewing gum may reduce our desire to eat, but that may not necessarily translate in preventing us from eating more, especially if we do not listen to our bodies and we continue to eat even beyond feeling full and satisfied. This is where I am curious, out of scientific curiosity, what can we do in order to prevent us from eating beyond satisfaction? And that's when slowing down the rate at which we eat helps because it gives time for our body and our brain to signal to one another that we are full. But I also wonder if a short period of fasting could somewhat act as a reset switch for us to listen to our bodies and allow our stomach and intestines to reset to somewhat of a homeostasis or normal level of functioning. I have found personally that a short period of fasting, such as 20 hours, has been able to help me reset my appetite, but that's just a sample size of one. I have yet to come across any scientific studies to see if a day of fasting could help reset appetite signaling, but I suppose it could be possible. I'd love to study that in a clinical trial one day. And I chatted about the scientific evidence of fasting back in episode 28, if you want to hear the details on that. Now, another thing that I found interesting was how the sound of the food may also serve as a satiety cue. For example, the crunch of eating fresh vegetables may act as another cue or a reminder to us of what and how much we are eating. Through several clinical trials, Elder and Moore in 2016 highlight how the sound and crunch of a food is strongly related to the satiety and satisfaction we may get from the food item, also known as the crunch effect. Just think of the sound of taking a bite of a crisp apple, the crunch of eating celery, or even the sound from eating chips. These all tend to be very salient or rewarding cues to us. Now, how about the neurobiology of this? How does the chewing or the sound of the food impact our eating behavior? And this is where I love to bring in fMRI studies. So fMRI stands for functional magnetic resonance imaging. It can give us insight into the amount of brain region recruitment when people are performing certain tasks. For example, which brain regions are important during chewing? and an fMRI study can give us insight. So for example, Quintero in 2013 in the Journal of Dental Research investigated just this. They used fMRI to evaluate brain activity in humans during gum chewing. Chewing was associated with recruitment in the cerebellum, motor cortex, caudate putamen, cingulate, and brainstem. Now much of this makes sense to me because the cerebellum and motor cortex are brain of our brain controls our movement. And obviously when we're chewing, there's a lot of movement going on in the oral cavity. But what was really interesting to me is the recruitment of the caudate putamen and the brainstem. Because intriguingly, these brain regions tend to be recruited more so near the initiation of gum chewing. And they regulate many things, but one of those things includes reward, pleasure, and satiety. So it is potentially possible that chewing may impact our feelings of pleasure and satiety or feeling satisfied because they act on brain regions that regulate those feelings. So chewing itself may induce satiety and satisfaction because of the brain regions they recruit. However, I think it is important to mention as I was reading through all of this research on chewing and eating behavior, that there's also an opposite side of the spectrum that prolonged chewing and even chewing on non-food items like chewing on fingernails 
has been frequently observed in individuals battling with anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, or disordered eating. For example, Gorda in 2004 noted that individuals who displayed very restrictive eating tended to have a habit of nail biting, chewing on fingers, and other items. So I want everyone listening to keep in mind that for some individuals, focusing on mindful eating and choosing foods that require more chewing could be very helpful to stay on track with healthy eating behavior. But for other individuals, it may become an obsession. And in this regard, this would be very detrimental. I think that this is the case for many lifestyle interventions. For example, intermittent fasting could be very beneficial for many people. But fasting may also lead to disordered eating in others. It is important to keep in mind that there is often a spectrum for many practices, and the healthy balance lies somewhere in the middle. So eating our food super fast and chewing our food very little is likely not good for many of us. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, taking a really long time to eat and perhaps obsessing with over-chewing food or counting the number of bites or another number of chews per bite, is also not good. In any case, I think it is interesting to consider the impact of greater chewing effort and the type of foods we consume or chewing time and how that may impact our appetite and food intake, since these could be exploited for appetite control or for those that battle with overeating. So the concept of mindful eating and perhaps consuming things like soups and smoothies which do not engage that satiety pathway, may explain why some people do not feel satisfied after having something like a smoothie or a soup, or as something like a big salad that has a lot of crunchy vegetables that requires greater effort for chewing, that might activate that satiety satisfaction brain region or pathway even more, and perhaps part of the reason why consuming something like a big salad could help people stay on track with healthier eating. So that is a wrap, my people scientist army, the science behind chewing and the impact on our appetite and desire to eat. Clinical trial evidence suggests that chewing our food for longer periods of time, chewing gum, or choosing foods that have a crunch may promote healthier eating. How is this possible? Because prolonged chewing seems to increase the release of gut satiety hormones like GLP-1 and cholecystokinin. And prolonged chewing time may also reduce hunger hormones like ghrelin. Prolonged chewing time also recruits brain regions like the caudate putamen that may play a role in reward and satisfaction. The crunch of food, like biting into a crisp apple, may also act as a salient or rewarding cue, which reminds us of the present act of eating to help us be more mindful with our eating. This science is all rooted in the concept of mindful eating. Mindful eating may be beneficial for some in order to increase the attention we give to the act of eating, to promote healthier eating and more appropriate portion sizes, and to also slow down our pace of eating so that our gut satiety hormones may have the time to signal to our brain that we are satisfied and full. In the same note, overthinking and habitual chewing may be a detrimental practice in disordered eating. So keeping in mind that everything in moderation is always key. I hope that this episode was interesting and insightful for all of you. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I look forward to meeting you all back here the same time and same place next week on the People Scientist Podcast. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates.